you please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John? We just sang Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, in the Gospel of John, Jesus fulfills Psalm 23, and he says that he is the good shepherd. So John 10, we'll read verses 7, 7 through 18 and 27 and 28. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And then verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's by the reading of God's word. Would you now turn with me also in your... Psalter hymnals to the back to page 872. And we are going to recite question and answer one and two of the Heidelberg Catechism. I'll read the question and you recite the answer in unison. Question one, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Question two. How many things must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery. Third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. So this is a catechetical sermon, meaning that we are going to be preaching the word of God as summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism. We're not preaching the Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism is not the word of God. But the Heidelberg Catechism is summarizing the word of God correctly and accurately. In fact, if you look in the, the hymnal there, you see all the footnotes Every single clause and sentence in the Heidelberg Catechism has a footnote referencing a passage of scripture to support that teaching. So we're going to focus in on the first question and answer. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And I see three main points in that first question and answer. I think that the 
answer to the, the uh, catechism question there is divided into three parts. You can even see with the indentation there, you have three paragraphs in the answer. The first paragraph is the comfort of belonging to Christ. The second paragraph is the cost of belonging to Christ. He fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. And then the third paragraph deals with the consequences of belonging to Christ. Because we belong to him, he assures us of eternal life and he makes us willing and ready to live for him. And so we're going to be looking at this theme of belonging to Christ. That is what the uh, Heidelberg Catechism is focusing on. What is your only comfort in life and in death? It's that I am not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. The comfort of belonging to Christ, the cost of belonging to Christ, and the consequences of belonging to Christ. First, the comfort of belonging to Christ. Now, it's interesting here that in the uh, Heidelberg Catechism, the very first proof text that is given is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. So if you'll turn there, you'll see where this language comes from, this language of, I'm not my own, but I belong to Christ. It's in 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, the context is that Paul is exhorting the Corinthian Christians to flee from sexual immorality, He's warning them that uh, their bodies are meant not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Their bodies are members of Christ and belong to Christ, and therefore they should be careful what they do with their bodies. So he says in verse 19, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body by being careful how you use your body and to make sure that you do not defile your body by joining your body to that which is unclean. So the Heidelberg Catechism here picks an interesting passage. It's not quite the one that would first come to mind, right, of thinking about this wonderful reality of what is your only comfort that you belong to Christ. But it is helpful, nevertheless, even though the context may be a little bit different from what we were thinking in terms of this call to flee from sexual immorality, yet the argument that Paul is making here is he's appealing to something deeper, even though in the context he's dealing with this specific issue of warning the Corinthians against sexual sin, yet he is, as Paul usually does, he goes beyond simply the statement, flee from the sin, and he gives a reason, he gives an argument. Paul always does this. He always goes back to first principles. What is the basics of the gospel that grounds this exhortation to live in a way that is sexually pure? And so he goes back to the first principles of the gospel. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, and therefore you must live for him. You belong to Christ. You don't belong to yourself to do with your body as you please. You've been bought with a price. Christ paid for all your sins with his precious blood, and therefore he owns you, and you belong to him. But the Heidelberg Catechism is using this theological principle that Christ has bought us with his precious blood, and therefore, as a result, we're not our own, but we belong to Christ, not primarily, at least at this point in the catechism, not primarily to exhort us and to tell us, therefore, we should live for Christ. That'll come at the end. He makes us wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. But the Heidelberg Catechism is appealing to this doctrine that we've been purchased by the blood of Christ and that we belong to him, primarily at this point to focus on the comfort that that gives us, the comfort of belonging to Christ, the comfort of knowing that we belong to him. And this is such a wonderful way of thinking about our relationship with Christ. There are many different metaphors that you could use to think about what it means to be a Christian. You know, one metaphor is union with Christ, that we have died with him and been raised with him, and that we're seated with him in the heavenly places. Uh, that's a very biblical Pauline metaphor for what it means to be a Christian. Uh, another metaphor that Paul uses is that we're married to Christ. He's our husband and we are the bride of Christ. Another metaphor is we're servants of Christ. We're called to follow him. He's our master and we're his servants and therefore we 
live for him and we obey him. But there's this other metaphor that is so maybe a little bit neglected, but the Heidelberg Catechism rightly elevates it to this point of primacy, that we belong to Christ, that we are his, that we are in his hand, that we are, we are clothed in his righteousness and therefore we are protected by him. We belong to him. We are not our own. We belong to Christ. This language of belonging to Christ is found throughout Paul's writings. It's, it's primarily a Pauline metaphor. Uh, for example, in Romans 1, verse 6, he says that uh, it's through Christ that he received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of the nations. And then he says, including you also who are in Rome, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Another occurrence of this language of belonging to Christ is in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. This is the passage about the resurrection, and he's talking about the future resurrection of the body, and he's saying that we know that the future resurrection of the body will happen because Christ has been raised as the first fruits of those who sleep. And so if the first fruits has been raised, then the rest of the harvest, that is all the believers, will also be raised with him in due time. And so in that context, he uses this language of belonging to Christ but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. I love that metaphor because you have this idea of, it's focusing on the future, it's focusing on eschatology, it's focusing on the end. And it's saying that the end, when Christ returns, the day of judgment, all these you know, really frightening, scary things are happening, the elements are melting with fervent heat, right? There's this terrible catastrophe, the end of the world, right? The day of judgment. But yet, in that time of judgment and fire and wrath and all the things that of this world are being shaken to bits, right? In that time, Christ has his own. He has his elect. He has his people. And so Christ has been raised as the first fruits, but then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And he's going to carry us with him into the new creation through the fires of judgment into the new creation. We belong to Christ. I think that this metaphor of belonging to Christ, it clearly does have this connotation, doesn't it, of there's something threatening that, right? There's something out there that is, you know, threatening this reality that uh, we need that protection of Christ. We need his hand to be upon us. We need his, his shepherding care to, to hold us and to protect us and to guard us and to keep us all the way to that heavenly kingdom, to the day of the new creation. That's why I chose John chapter 10 to uh, further explain this idea. The uh, Gospel of John does not use the term belonging to Christ, doesn't use that phrase, but it's something very similar. It says that we are his sheep. He's the shepherd and we are his sheep. He speaks, Jesus speaks repeatedly of my sheep that are particularly my own. They belong to me and I know them and they know me. He, he calls them his own sheep. Uh, in John chapter 10 and uh, in verse, where was that? Um, I think it's verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. He speaks about his flock as being those whom he protects from the wolves, as those whom he will protect from anything that might threaten that relationship. And so this is a wonderful way of thinking about the Christian life, that we belong to Christ, that we belong to him. Now notice that the catechism also says we belong to him, body and soul, in life and in death. And that's an interesting uh, qualifier there because it, it, it shows us that, again, there's this idea of threat, right? Because even in death, we belong to Christ, that nothing can take us away from Christ. This idea of belonging to Christ in life and in death is taken from Romans 14. In Romans 14, verses 7 through 9, uh, Paul says, For none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. 
our entire being, not just our bodies, but also our souls, are owned by Christ and belong to him, and therefore nothing can challenge that, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I also like how the Catechism says that we belong to, it says there, I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Why this language of the Savior being faithful? Well, I think it focuses on the idea that he laid down his life for us, but he also intercedes for us, and he is faithful to keep us and to guard us until the last day. He not only purchased redemption for us, he effectually and apl certainly applies it to each of the elect, and he keeps us and preserves us in the faith all the way to the end. I was searching the New Testament to find where does the New Testament use this language of Christ being a faithful Savior. And it doesn't use those exact words together, faithful Savior, but it does use the phrase that he's a faithful high priest in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 2, verse 17. He's a merciful and faithful high priest. And I think that's part of the context here. I think that, that the catechism is alluding to this idea of Christ being a faithful high priest, because what is the high priest's job? The high priest's job is to intercede on behalf of the people. He represents the nation, the nation of Israel, and he represents them before God. He's the one that goes into the Holy of Holies bearing the breastplate that has the 12 stones that representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And if he's accepted there in the presence of God, then the nation is accepted because he represents them. And so he's faithful to them. He's faithful to preserve them. He's faithful to intercede for them. He's faithful to apply the atonement to them and to make sure that they are accepted before God. And the author of Hebrews loves to, to, to dwell on this wonderful aspect of the work of Christ that we sometimes don't think about. We think about the death of Christ. We think about the resurrection of Christ. But he focuses on after the resurrection and even after that, after his exaltation, he's in heaven at the right hand of God interceding for us as a great high priest. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That is what it means that he is a faithful savior, is that he not only atoned for our sins, but that he even now is making intercession for us and is faithfully securing the accomplishment of that atonement and the full outworking of that atonement so that not only are our sins forgiven, but we are continually being preserved and kept in the faith and maintained to the very end. Now what about the uh, second major paragraph there, the cost of belonging to Christ? Well, it says he has fully paid for all our sins with his precious blood and has delivered us from the tyranny of the devil. Again, going back to 1 Corinthians 6, you're not your own because you've been bought with a price. The price is the precious blood of Christ. He has fully paid for all of our sins with his precious blood. Going back to the Gospel of John, isn't that the main point of what Jesus is saying? He's saying he is the good shepherd and he knows his sheep, he knows them by name, he knows them individually, he knows each of his elect. But the main point of the good shepherd is that he lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 11, John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, unlike the hired hands who don't care for the flock, and so when the wolf comes, they just leave and let the sheep be snatched away. He's not like that. He is a faithful shepherd. He's a good shepherd. And what he does is he lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, he says it again. He says, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And again, verse 10, he lays it down of his own accord. He has received this charge, this commandment, this covenant from his Father. So the first point was the comfort of belonging to Christ, but now we need to think about how is it that we belong to Christ? How is it that we come from this state of, 
uh, at one time being outside of Christ to now being in Christ and belonging to Christ and being his sheep. Well, it is only because of the atoning work of Christ. It is because of his death upon the cross, which was done in obedience to the will of the Father, this charge I have received from my Father. And so this brings us then to a really interesting point, which is that right here in the Heidelberg Catechism, we had the very first question and answer, we have implicitly, it's not explicit, but it's kind of implicit in the background, we have implicitly this idea of limited atonement, right? We know, of course, the five points of Calvinism, tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, L is limited atonement, and the canons of Dort explain all of those points in detail. But the Heidelberg Catechism also here, at the very beginning, is implicitly teaching the same concept, right? Because he didn't lay down his life, he didn't fully pay for the sins of everyone, right? He fully paid for my sins with his precious blood, and he delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. And as a result, he purchased me so that I belong to him and not to the world and not to the devil. When I was becoming Reformed, when I was in college and I was exposed to Reformed theology, that third point of TULIP, limited atonement, was the one that had the most impact on me. And I found it to be so encouraging and so helpful in my, in my faith. Because it's not as though what Christ did is simply make possible for people to be saved if they activate it by accepting it and believing in it. It's that Christ actually accomplished the salvation of the elect. His work was effective. Uh, the Canons of Dort put it this way. This is, um, it's the second head of doctrine, Article 8. And if you want to read along, it's on page 904 in the back of the hymnal. It's called, the title of Article 8 is The Saving Effectiveness of Christ's Death. See that idea? It's that his, his death is effective. It's not just that he makes it possible for people to be saved if they activate it by receiving it. It's not as though the atonement is just that uh, Jesus uh, purchased some medicine that's on the medicine cabinet, and then anyone who of their own free will chooses to take the medicine can receive it. No, it's that Christ actually effectively atoned for the sins of all of his people. So the Canons of Dort puts it this way, for it was the entirely free plan and very gracious will and intention of God the Father, that the enlivening and saving effectiveness of his son's costly death should work itself out in all his chosen ones, in order that he might grant justifying faith to them only, and thereby lead them without fail to salvation. So the death of Christ actually purchased faith for the elect. His death was so effective that he actually secured the faith that is needed to apply the work of Christ to them. In other words, it was God's will that Christ, through the blood of the cross, by which he confirmed the new covenant, should effectively redeem from every people, tribe, nation, and language all those and only those who were chosen from eternity to salvation and given to him by the Father, that he should grant them faith, which, like the Holy Spirit's other saving gifts, he acquired for them by his death, that he should cleanse them by his blood from all their sins, both, actu both original and actual, whether committed before or after their coming to faith, that he should faithfully preserve them to the very end, and that he should finally present them to himself, a glorious people without spot or wrinkle. He has accomplished our salvation. He didn't just simply make it possible for us to be saved, on condition that we then make it applicable to ourselves by going to the medicine cabinet and taking the medicine. No, he accomplished it. He even accomplished the faith. He even earned and acquired the faith itself by which we receive the atoning work of Christ. And all that is implied right here in Heidelberg Catechism question and answer number one. You belong to Christ. Why? Because the cost of belonging to Christ is that he fully paid for all of your sins with his precious blood. And he delivered us from the tyranny of the devil. 
Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He didn't deliver all mankind, including the non-elect, from the devil. He delivered us, his people, his sheep, from the power of the devil. He transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. <coughs> and so this idea of the saving effectiveness of Christ's work, that's why sometimes uh, pastors and theologians will say, maybe a better term for that third point of TULIP is not limited atonement, but particular redemption. That it's a particular redemption that accomplishes that which it was intended to accomplish. He not only purchased the atonement for us, but he also purchased the application of it to each of those who are elect. And for me, when I was becoming reformed, that was the thing that most helped me in my walk with the Lord. It gave me assurance. Um, the church I was raised in taught this Arminian view that all God did was make possible for us to be saved, and then it's up to us to activate it and make it apply to ourselves by believing. But they also taught a very strange teaching. They taught that uh, not all who are Christians will go, will go to heaven, that there are some Christians who are carnal Christians who don't really walk with the Lord, who will be, they won't go to hell, but they will be in the suburbs of heaven, in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because they missed out on the beauty of heaven itself, the glory of the inheritance, they called it. Uh, they said, everyone who's a Christian is part of the church, but only the really sincere and devoted and, and victorious Christians are the bride of Christ. And they're the only ones that will uh, obtain the inheritance. Uh, the other Christians, the carnal Christians, they won't go to hell, but they will be forever missing out on the wonderful reality of being with the Lord in heaven. And they will be in a, a state of great fear and almost like purgatory, right? It's not hell, but it's kind of like purgatory. But you see how once I came to understand this idea of limited atonement or more accurately particular redemption, then it became clear that this, that's not possible, right? If Christ truly paid for the sins of his people, then how can there be weeping and gnashing of teeth for any of those for whom he shed his blood? He has atoned for our sins. He has guaranteed that all those for whom he died will be saved and will persevere to the end, trusting in Christ, and will make it all the way to the good part of heaven, to the place where there is no weeping and gnashing of teeth, but joy and delight and being with the Lord forever. That is what Christ has accomplished for us. There aren't two tiers of Christians. There is only one body of Christ, there's only one bride of Christ, and it is all those for whom Christ died, the sheep of Christ, whom he knows by name. Remember he said that back in John, 8, John chapter 10. He said, I know them by name. He knows each individual person for whom he died and shed his blood. And even now he's in heaven interceding for us and making sure that we are saved to the uttermost. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus, uh, the catechism is quoting there from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, uh, verses 28 to 31. And in fact, all things must work together for my salvation, quoting from Romans 8, verse 28. But then that brings us to the third point, the third paragraph, the consequences of belonging to Christ. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. This is so beautiful. This is, this is really life-transforming, if you think about it. We have the comfort of belonging to Christ. We have the cost of belonging to Christ. But now we have the consequences of belonging to Christ. And there are two consequences according to the Catechism. Assurance and sanctification. Assurance 
meaning being assured and being confident and knowing that we have eternal life, and sanctification, that is, the Lord working in us and transforming us and making us willing and ready to live for Christ, to live as obedient servants of Christ, because we belong to Christ. This answers the antinomian objection. The antinomian objection is the objection that was brought up in Romans chapter 6 after Paul had proclaimed the wonderful reality that we're justified, we're declared righteous in God's sight, not by anything that we do, not by our works, but only by faith in Jesus Christ. But the antinomian objection is, well then, if that's true, should we just continue in sin? that grace may abound? If we're justified by faith alone, apart from works, apart from obedience, then why do we need to be obedient? Do we just live as we please? Live for ourselves? And the answer is no, because we belong to Christ. And Paul goes on to talk about that in terms of the metaphor of union with Christ. We've died with Christ and been raised with Christ, and therefore we belong to him. This is the answer to the, not only the antinomian objection, but it's also the answer to those who overreact against that, right? There are many who are very concerned about antinomianism, very concerned about this idea that we, because of free grace, we can just live how we please, and so they want to have an antidote to that. They want to have an answer to that idea of free grace, meaning that you can live as you please, and they, they, the answer they give is that we must submit to the lordship of Christ as the condition of salvation and as the condition of assurance. But the catechism, rightly following the teaching of Paul in Romans 6, gives a different answer. The answer is not that we submit to the lordship of Christ as the condition of assurance. The answer is we have to understand what it means to be saved in the first place, right? What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean that we are Christ's sheep? It means that we are not our own, but we belong to him because he paid the price. And now because we belong to him, as those who have been redeemed freely by grace, not by anything that we do, because we belong to him, he now has these two consequences for his own, for his sheep, that he assures us of eternal life, and then he also transforms us, he sanctifies us, and makes us willing and ready from now on to live for him. The word gratitude is not used here in this particular question and answer of the catechism, but you can sort of see it by implication, right? Because we belong to him, because we've been purchased by him, and we belong to him, therefore we're not our own, but now we willingly want to serve our Lord and our Savior. Yes, that does mean submitting to the Lordship of Christ, but not as the condition of salvation, it's as the consequence of salvation. Because I belong to him. That's the key phrase there, right? This is just so life, tra life transforming when you look at it. Because I belong to him, he assures me of eternal life and makes me willing. It's not that he uh, makes me willing and therefore because I'm willing, now I submit to him and then now I have assurance. No, it's that because I belong to him, because he's paid for all my sins, because he's transferred me from the grip of the devil into this new kingdom of Christ, he now assures me, he gives me his spirit, he fills me with the spirit, and he makes me willing and ready and desirous to live for him. I love the way the Apostle Paul talks about this. There are a couple of passages where you see this heart of Paul, and you see it reflected here in the catechism itself. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 15 is one of the ones that stands out to me. Listen to how Paul describes this. He says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, that is for all believers, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that all those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You see how he's talking about this idea of, it's exactly what the catechism is saying, this idea of how could I, live for myself anymore when I've been purchased by this wonderful Savior. When I have died with him to sin and I've been raised with him to a new life, and so he has done all this for me, and so the love of Christ now is what controls me. The love of Christ 
is what uh, transforms me and makes me willing and ready from now on to live not for myself, but for him who for my sake died and was raised. Paul has this very personal relationship with Christ. He knows Christ as his own personal Lord and Savior. And he looks to him and he feels compelled by that love of Christ to live for him. It's a totally different way of thinking about the Christian life instead of thinking about it in this morose, dark way of, oh, I don't have assurance, but if I just go out and strive harder against my sins, then maybe I can have assurance. It's this joyful response of gratitude and love and thanksgiving and this desire to live for the one who died for you. You see the same thing in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 11. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I love that phrase, my Lord, his own personal Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see how Paul just has this amazing Christocentric life. He, he, his whole life is just, I love Jesus, and I want to live for Jesus, and he's this great, glorious Savior, and he's counting everything else but loss in view of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He desires to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And so the catechism here is very accurately reflecting and pulling together all these strands of teaching from the Gospel of John and from Paul's letters and teaching us the Gospel, teaching us the essence of what it means to be a Christian, using this very, very helpful metaphor of belonging to Christ to cover all these aspects of what it means to be a Christian. Now, we don't have much time to get into it, but just quickly looking at question and answer number two, how many things must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Basically three things. We must know our misery because of our sinfulness. We must know how we're delivered from all our sins and misery through Christ. And we must also know how to thank God for that deliverance. Sometimes it's summarized as guilt, grace, and gratitude misery, deliverance, and gratitude. And you can even see that these three points, of course, that's the outline for the rest of the Heidelberg Catechism, but you can even see how those three points are implicit in question and answer one, right? They don't, question and answer one doesn't dwell on it, but that first point, knowing our sin and misery, it's implied there when it says that Christ paid for all our sins with his precious blood and delivered us from the tyranny of the devil, so that there was something dark and black out there before the redemption our sins and being under the grip of Satan. That's our misery. And then deliverance. Of course, that's the main point of question and answer one, is our deliverance, that we belong to Christ because of what he has done for us. But then we also see that third point of gratitude, as I mentioned before in the third paragraph. Because we belong to Christ, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures us of eternal life and makes us wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on, to live for him. Let us close in prayer. Lord.